in in data and ai domains and i have been doing it for the past 6 years so i that's what is my specialty so i'm certified i'm a microsoft certified trainer i've certified myself on lot of data certifications of microsoft including pl300 that is power bi the current certification that is microsoft fabric also that is dp600 i have myself certified on it so now um let's start with today's training it's uh, about dp900 what is dp900 and all of that we are going to see so i'll just start i'll just share my screen so i can see that we don't have a large participant count it's around uh, 26 of us so i'll try and complete the session as early as possible because it's a saturday it's a weekend so i i want i mean everyone wants to you know kind of um enjoy the weekend so i'll try and sum it up as fast as possible wherever uh, because it's just a fundamental certification uh, if you are i'm just going to talk about it so i'll try and sum it up as soon as possible so that you all will be free for the rest of the evening now let's start with the so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start with the overview of the certification what is dp 900 uh what does it cover basically and uh after dp 900 what kind of certifications can you do okay all of that i'm going to discuss i'll also talk about the concepts of uh, module wise so there are four modules that we are going to see and uh i will be talking about them so i'll be showing some demo related to those modules as well so so we are not providing you a certification after completion so what archi uh, mentioned is that we are going to provide you something called as a course achievement badge so course achievement badge is like a participation certificate that we provide for this train for attending this particular uh, training or this particular webinar so that's what we are going to provide you so she will definitely be sharing the guidelines for it i, I think post the break we will be doing this activity so just uh, <clears throat> it's not a certificate so in case you want to get yourself certified on dp 900 you will have to give a certification exam which is called as dp 900 is your data fundamental certification certification and it is uh, i will also talk about the certificate like how can you schedule the exam where to schedule the exam what is the cost of the certification and since uh, rg mentioned we are microsoft partners so we can also give you exam um, uh this exam vouchers at a discounted rate so in case you want those exam vouchers you can contact archi she has i think shared her email id in the chat yeah or she will do it later so uh, so that you all can directly uh mess i mean email her or you can even call us and we will give you the dp 900 exam voucher at a discounted rate so let's go ahead and understand about this course okay what does dp 900 basically do what is the objective of dp 900 let's just understand so if you see like microsoft has various certifications in various services okay when we talk about az az is basically something that talks about cloud fundamentals okay what is a resource group what is pas sas ias all of that the different cloud models that are there so and if you want to do administration or uh, security etc you should look at the az certification or the sc series of certifications that are there then you have ai also like you have ai 900 a ai 102 which are certifications related to microsoft uh, azure ai services okay which talks about that and it talks about how skilled you are i mean it, if you get a certification it means you are skilled on that particular service then comes the dp series okay which is which uh, talks about the data concepts or it is related to the data part of the, the technology it talks about all the data technologies that are there on azure okay it will talk about of course the fundamentals of data 
will be covered in the DP 900 certification. But if, let's say you want to go ahead in the DP series. So you can also go ahead in that you have DP 100, which is for data science. So when we do the roles, okay, data roles, I will explain the certifications also attached because Microsoft has come up with uh, role specific certifications also, which you can also pursue later. So I will talk about all of that towards the end of the webinar. So coming to DP, so DP, like I said, is something that is focusing on the data part of the technology, how to handle data, manage data is what it basically talks about. It talks about making your foundation uh, of data concepts strong. Okay, and also talks about the data, core data services that are available on the Azure cloud platform. Okay, so here you will learn about uh, relational databases, you will learn about storage accounts, you will learn about analytics, because I feel like, I mean, you, we all know about it, that data and analytics go hand in hand, right? Uh, we all come from an enterprise and in enterprises, we know that we need to analyze the sales data. We need to understand. We need to analyze the financial data. We need to understand marketing trends that are there. So in order to do that. Um, So here we are not going to be there till the evening, guys. First of all, this webinar is only till the afternoon. That is 3.30 uh, p.m. Okay, 3.30 p.m. is when we are supposed to end. And like I said, since there are not many participants, so I will try and complete the... It's just a webinar. It's not a training at all. I'm not going to train you all on DP. This thing, I'm just going to give you all an overview of every module in, the, uh, in this particular uh, certification. And like I said, we are not going to give you... Uh, uh, Archie, Archie, are you there? So, can, Archie, can you just confirm whether my presentation is visible or not? Or anyone else? Please just let me know if my presentation is visible, whether I'm audible or not. Okay, so Harsh, uh, please check your internet. Just switch to the uh, presenter view. I think then that will be possible. I mean, then you can see it. So please switch to the presenter view that is there. Okay, so uh, coming to your question, Jagat, we are not giving you a certificate. Okay, it's not a certificate from Microsoft. Okay, we are providing you with something called as a course achievement badge. Okay, which is like a participation certificate that you attended this webinar with us. Okay, we are just providing you that. But if you want to get yourself certified on DP 900, okay, so there is a difference in what we are going to provide you. Okay, so it's just a participation certificate that we are providing. Okay, whereas uh, if you want to show that you are skilled on it, you have knowledge about this particular this thing, then you will have to give the Microsoft certification, which I will talk about how you can give it. Okay, this everything I am going to cover uh, towards the end of the webinar. Okay, so this is what is the course. This is what is DP 900, which covers the fundamentals of uh, Harsh. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. I will definitely address the question um, because I can't allow everyone to unmute and talk. Okay, so please, guys, if you have any questions, I will address them in the chat. Please feel free to put it here. And if you have any non-technical questions about exam vouchers um, and more uh, webinars, if you want to attend with us, please tag Archie. Archie will address all those questions for you all. Now, moving ahead, uh, this particular certification, that is DP 900, is modules. Okay, it talks about four modules. That is, the first module talks about the core data concepts. Okay, it will cover the fundamentals of what is data, what are the different types of data that is available, what are the different formats of 
data. All of that is what we are going to talk in the first module. Then the second module moves on the relational part, that is relational databases. It is going to talk about the SQL concepts in your on top of a database. Okay, what what are the different services that are available on Azure related to the relational data. Okay, uh, for relational data, it is going to talk about that. Then the third module is going to talk about the NoSQL databases or the non-relational uh, databases that are there, the non-relational data that is available, uh, and how can you manage that sort of data in Microsoft Azure, which is the related service that you can use. And lastly, we are going to talk about some of the analytical workloads. Okay, how can you manage? So there is a difference between OLTP, OLAP, which we are going to see. Okay, which is generally like OLTP is used in database and OLAP is used in data warehouse and how you can use certain analytical services of Azure to like, like I talked about reporting or analysis, or if you want to uh, orchestrate certain things, okay, how can you use uh, those services in Azure is what we are going to see over here. So now coming to the exam, to DP 900 cert certification. I'm sorry, this is not AZ 900. It is DP 900. It's an error that is there. So coming to the certification, this is the distribution or this is the weightage uh, module wise. Okay, module wise, this is the distribution of the modules. How much percentage of questions will be asked from each module is what we are talking over here. Okay, so uh, the first uh, is, so the first module has the highest weightage, that is 25 to 30%. Then you have the next module having 20 to 25%. That means this percentage basically, guys, indicates the number of questions that can come in the exam and from which module, how many uh, questions can come. It is talking about that. So links with you all as well, which will uh, talk about, uh, which will have all these information that uh, all the information that I've just mentioned over here in the presentation. So all of that will be specified over here. So Harsh, if you still can't see the screen, please uh, switch to the uh, presenter tab. Like, please uh, switch to the presenting view or something like that. I don't re remember um, that. So, or please log in to the session again. If and just check your internet connectivity because I, others can uh, see my screen. So just uh, Harsha, sorry, Harsha, I'm sorry. Just uh, rejoin the session and check once. Now let's start. Let's talk about the first module in our DP 900 yeah. certification. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, let's start with module one that is talking about the core concepts. of data. So let's just understand, first of all, what is data? OK, uh, so I would like to hear from you all. OK, what is your understanding of data? OK, what is the definition of data? Because we all know nowadays data is something that is uh, very, very critical. It is something that every organization uh, requires because without data, like I said, if I want to analyze my sales, okay, if I want to analyze my uh, financial data, how much profit have I earned? 
okay i want to understand the marketing trend we will not be able to function no organization is going to able to function we need to understand why i have our sales gone down or what was the reason the sales boosted did it did the marketing campaign help us did it not or okay all that information if i have to find out okay we need data so yes absolutely right the definition guy 3 is absolutely on point is that data is something that is information okay it is so the presentation unfortunately we are not allowed to share guys uh, microsoft has a strict policy of not to share the presentations uh, so i will be sharing the reference links towards the end the study material i will be uh, sharing with you all once i complete the overview of every module okay i will be doing that and of course i will be sharing a, a reference documentation for the dp 900 exam also okay so all that i will be doing towards the end so now coming to the first module we are talking about core data concepts so as as rightly put we need to first of all understand what is data okay so data is nothing but information okay it's nothing but information it is nothing but a fact okay like for example we have information that is a name our names are information it is data our email ids our phone numbers our uh, social media handle accounts whatever that whatever you put images that you post videos that you post or audio video files that you create photos that you click okay all of that is nothing but data okay it is nothing but data data is information it is a fact okay that is presented to us that is something that is uh that is conveying some sort of information to us like the sales data or the just one minute guys okay so now when we talk about data okay data is divided into three types do you all know which are the three types of data that is there types of data guys can you let me know in the chat so it's if you already have knowledge guys just let me know in the chat uh, what are the three types of data that is there okay so data is divided into three types let me know if you all know the answer to this question otherwise i will be explaining it to you all for sure yes guys what are the three types of data yes absolutely right guys absolutely right so there are three types of data that is first is the structured data okay second is the semi structured data and third is the unstructured data okay so data like i said is information it is something that is a fact okay sales data financial data they are facts they are numbers or they could be text okay it could be of any uh, it is a fact right after all but now this data because the size of the data is large okay and the type of the data can also matter and the types of the data are structured data semi structured data and unstructured data now what is 
So before we understand the types of the data, data also has two formats. Okay, data is also divided. So it is naturally divided into type, but it also has two formats attached to it. So format, formats of data. So the first format of data, which was earlier very popularly used, which was called as the file format. If you have data, if you have data, okay, stored in the form of a file, like we know we've been using files, we still use files, right? Whether it's a Word file, Excel file, or a PowerPoint presentation file, or text file or a CSV file or an image file or an audio file, etc. Something that has an extension to it, your name, right? You give a name dot an extension that is nothing but a file. So this is one of the ways in which you can store your data. Correct. This is one way you can store your data. Yes, absolutely right. These are nothing but the way of one way of storing the data is your file format. And the second way of storing the data is the table format. Table, something that has rows and columns. So there is a, I mean, there's a column, and within those columns, you have your data stored. Okay, in rows. So let's say we talk about an employee. So employee information, because in an organization, we have lots of employees working. So if I want to keep a track of my employees, I kind of create a table and I can then access the data of a specific employee. So the data is stored in two formats. That is the table format and the file format. Now coming to, let's understand the let's understand what is a structured data, what is an semi-structured data, and what is an unstructured data. So let's say so structured meaning fixed schema. Okay, there is a schema that is attached, there's a structure that is there to your data, and that is called as a structured data, okay? That is termed as a structured data. So a structured data is something that will have a structure, will have something called as a fixed schema, okay? It is something that will have a fixed schema. So when we talk about So when we talk about an employee table, so generally data in this particular structure is stored in a tabular format. That is the table format in rows and columns. So generally the data that we find in databases, okay, data in databases. So generally this is what we find over here. is what is basically the structured data. You also can have a file format, which is the tab, tab or we also call it as uh, delimited text. Okay, so delimited text has two formats of files. So even your file format, which is CSV, comma, TSVs, okay, these are also, I'll just write it in, TSV, comma, TSV, that is comma separated values and um, tab separated values. So here also it is a structure. There is a structure that after every comma, okay, there is a value stored. And we all know in a CSV, the first row is a header, is the header that describes the, the first value, the second value, the third value, correct? 
so this is also a structured data because we know after every value there is going to be a comma that will be there so that is a def defined or a fixed schema to that data and that is why csv tsvs or the delimited text that we say is also a part of your structured data so data that has fixed schema okay so like your employee table or you can also talk about the product tables or the customer table so here we have the eid we have e names e name we have the salary of the employee correct so this kind of a uh, data is termed as the structured data it is termed as a structured data because here when we create or when we define the data okay the columns or the entities okay these columns that you see eid e name salary they are also termed as entities so these entities have a fixed schema now what does schema mean so let's say eid we have which is the employee code or the employee id that is where so whenever you join an organization you get like a number okay any organization that you go you get like a number so that number is a way of uniquely identifying a value which is in terms of databases also called as a primary key which we will discuss in the next module so that is what the next module talks about okay or a description of the relational data it is also called relational because why i'll just mention here so here you can have a department table okay where let's say another column you have attached in your so i'll just give random values so here every employee works in a certain department correct and generally okay so let's say i have this value i have department name i just go with this as of now so i'm also explaining the database concepts also that is module 2 so i'm just combining all of it so that you know because it's something that you cup you have we have to eventually cover so i'll spend more time so this is more like a combination of module 1 and module 2 that i am uh, doing okay and this is what is also asked in the exam guys uh, just a minute i'll just have some water Okay. So here, if you see, like, let's say I have a table like this, okay. And what will happen? So let's say this is a marketing department. Ten is marketing. Twenty is HR. Again, marketing, and let's say thirty is sales. So when I have a table which is like this, or let me take another example. okay so let's say we have this table okay let's say we have this table
so here let's say we are talking about uh we are, it, it's an institute okay and in that institute uh or it's a college or an university you can consider and we know that there are lots of students who enroll to an university or a college correct so let's say i have a table where i am maintaining the i have a database where i'm maintaining a table for the entire college inside that i have a, a student id which is nothing but the roll number correct whenever we had we went to a college right we were always given a roll number okay and along with the roll number we have our name that we give then of course when we go to a college it's not that everyone enrolls there is one course only that goes on for a specific course like science also we can enroll for multiple subjects right we can have multiple subjects so we will enroll for that course so let's say we have a course id okay and the name of that course id and let's say i want to find out i mean i also want to store the information of the faculty who is going to teach this particular course okay to the or who is teaching that particular course in the university or in or in the college so here if you see this is my table which is stored in a database okay this is my table that is stored in a database so now over here what is happening is that if you see i have all the data in one table i have all the data in one table so let's say so here if you see at times there are certain values that are repeating you can see that certain values are repeating right you can see all we have c1 c2 c all of these values are repeating that means multiple students can enroll in multi, in the same course correct multiple students can enroll in the same course and along with that we also have the course name and the faculty also repeating so here you can see that rahul kiran and sunita have enrolled for the same course so that what happens their um, course id is the same okay their faculty id also becomes the same and values are repeating okay we also call it as redundancy okay we also term it as redundancy so here what is happening is that the values are repeating at multiple places at multiple records or in multiple rows correct now let's say i have a new course that i have added at my university so now what is happening since all the data is present in one table so what will happen let's say i have a new course that is getting added so here what will happen is that in the column id i mean in the course id you will add the course id which will be a new course id because c2 is python c1 is zbms so let's say you have another course i'll just call this as java more relatable not mbbs okay so here what will happen so you let's say you have introduced a new course in your at your university and currently there is no one who has enrolled for that course currently nobody has enrolled for that course so what will happen is that or let's say you haven't even hired a faculty to teach for that course okay you haven't hired a faculty to teach for that course so what will happen the student id that is the roll number the student name the faculty id the faculty name all these ah uh, sorry all these values or these attributes are going to remain null are going to remain null so what will happen here is that if i try to insert anything if i try to insert anything it is going to give me null values okay it is going to give me null values now let's say somebody has enrolled into the course so what will happen you will have to create a new value you will have to give the name so it could be any name okay we can just say um and let's say she has enrolled for c3 which is java and now let's say again no faculty has been allocated so what will happen it will be a problem 
right? Let's say still no faculty as well, and you started with the admissions. So here you can see that you're getting various redundant values, and you can see that there is a chance of missing values or no values getting added for that attribute. So it leads to certain problems. Okay, it leads to certain anomalies that is called as the insertion, deletion, and updation anomalies. So when you have all the data in one table, okay, it is practically not possible to store everything there because it is going to lead to, like we discussed, redundancy, meaning the data is getting replicated. Data gets replicated. Okay, multiple values you will find of the same data. And secondly, it can also lead to null values or empty values, correct, in your table. So here also, if you see that I have all the data in one table. So that is why, okay, because it will lead to anomalies. So these problem leads to anomalies. Like insertion. If you insert or insert any value, okay, it is going to be a problem. If you delete any value, so the entire delete, I mean, the entire row gets deleted. This is what we know, right? From a database, if you remove a certain, they say it's not that you can, let's say you have, let's say you have stopped or you have discontinued Python course, okay? You have to remove this value. So how are you going to remove that value? There is no way in which you can remove that value, right? Let's say you have discontinued the Python course. Python, yeah, you are no longer offering this course at your institute or at your college, okay? How do you remove that? So what will happen? You will have to delete this entire row and all the values will go. But let's say Varun has, is enrolled for another course. So how will you keep a track of that? Currently, he was in C2, probably he's not there. So you'll have to delete the entire this thing. Probably Varun is present at some, uh, is enrolled with some other courses also. So here what happens if you remove anything, the entire row gets deleted, correct? How do you keep a track of that? Now, instead of, now Python is no longer there, C2 is gone. You need to make this as C2. So you'll have to do all those changes. You'll have to update the data. How do you do it? Everything gets affected in the table and you're querying also when you write something called as equal. So what is SQL? SQL is nothing but structured, oh sorry, yeah, structured query language, which you use in order to query, that is question your database or the tables stored in the database, correct? That is structured. So over here, whenever you type or you write the query to query the data, you want to find out the employee information of a specific employee. How do you do that? You, that is practically not possible because let's say that data has gone and you don't know about it. You have deleted or you have updated the data. So it's going to lead to those anomalies in the data. And in order to solve this problem, in order to reduce the redundancy, in your data, we follow a process called as normalization. We follow a process called as normalization. So normalization is basically uh, removing redundant data so that you don't have you don't have replication of the data, okay? And you normalize that particular table. So here, instead of having the department information over here, what will you do? You will just create, you will just keep the department number over here. That is the primary key of the department table. Okay. And instead of having multiple values, you will have single value. So here it will become sales. And now 
what do you do? So this becomes your department table. This becomes your department table. And now you link these two tables and the way of linking them is called as So this is what is basically DP. I mean, this is what is covered in DP 900. Okay, so just hold on like this is what I'm just explaining to you all what is covered. Okay, and I'll be talking about I'll be showing you all demos also. So in case you want to see the demos, then do stay for the conversation that is there. Okay. So this is what is basically covered in DP 900. So like I said, you all will already know some of the concepts because if you are from the data background, okay, it's what basically DP 900 covers. So this is what is covered in the module two normalization. It talks about the types of normalizations that is one NF, two NF, three NF. Okay, and I think, yeah, I think, till, sorry, three NF. Okay, and it talks about the relationships. It talks about the relationships and the cardinality. Now, what is a cardinality? Let me just explain. So cardinality is basically like here, if you see, we have the department table, we have the employee table. Correct. And I told you all that we can't have the values in one table because it leads to anomalies. It leads to redundant data. OK, so we normalize the tables and we then create a relationship between two tables. Correct. We create relationship between the two tables. So the relationship is determined by something called as the cardinality. So cardinality in simple terms indicates that how many instances, okay, how many instances of one entity or one table is related to the instances in the other entity or the other table? So when two tables are in relationship, okay, when two tables are in relationship and if I want to determine what kind of relationship they have, that means let's say here, if you see we have only one instance, right? There is only one value that is talking about the department tables. But if you see in the employee table, there are multiple instances, multiple times the value of department 10 is repeating if you see right it is repeating so this kind of a relationship is called as a one is too many relationship it is termed as a one is too many relationship so that is what is basically cardinality if i want to see how two tables are in the i mean are related with each other that means how many instances in one table is related to the instances in the other table that is termed as cardinality. So cardinality is of four types. You have one is to many. You have another variant of one is to many, which is many is to one. Okay, you can just reverse them in whichever format you want. The other is one is to one. And lastly, you have many is to many. So this particular relationship is something that is uh, very, uh, I mean, it's not a good practice to use. Okay, that means you have many instances from one table, that is, let's say, employee table being related to many instances in the department table. OK, so this kind of a cardinality leads to a lot of ambiguity, a lot of complexity. So it's not a good practice to use this kind of cardinality that is there. 
then you have one is to one where you have one is to one that is one instance from one table being related to the other instance only one instance that means here there is only one employee working in the marketing department only one employee working in the hr department and only one employee working in the sales department so this is what is basically in one is to one okay and then you have one is to many okay or many is to one so here you just have to see in what direction are you relating the two tables which table is coming on the left hand side which table is coming on the right hand side is what you are basically showing okay so this is what is basically covered in module 2 okay of uh, dp 900 and uh, yeah so this is a structured data Okay, why? It, and this structured data is also termed as relational data. Let's say you have data stored in tables. Okay, and like we discussed, we can't have data stored in one table. You need multiple tables. Okay, and if I have to now get data from multiple tables, because let's say I want to see data of the employee and the department together. Okay, we need to put those tables in relationship, okay? We need to relate them, then only we can fetch the data from the two tables, okay? And that is what is called as relational database management, that is RDBMS, relational database management service, okay? Which will help us you know, access data and the data is stored in the tabular format, which is related with each other. Okay. And in order to question or in order to find out the employee data or the department data or the combined data of these two tables, we write the structured query language. You write the structured query language on top of your database and this kind of a database where you have tables in relation is termed as a relational database okay and in the market we have lots of relational databases we have the sql server which is a microsoft service for the relational database we have a very popular one which is oracle Okay, Oracle company has its own relational database. We have MySQL, MySQL server also. We also have PostGre, which is a service. So these are nothing but relational databases. Okay, and if I have to store the relational tables, we need to use a database, which is called as a relational database and this is how it is done so your structured data that we find is generally the uh, tabular format is stored in the on top of databases so databases are of two types okay we have the sql database and we also have the no sql database so no sql is generally um is also a data so this is so databases are also relational databases and you have no non relational databases also where which where the data is basically on top of this you apply something called as no sql okay you write no sql no sql meaning not only sql it doesn't mean not sql it means not no, not only in SQL is what it basically means. So you need certain additional way of querying these databases because data is not stored in a structured format. This is generally an unstructured format. There is very, I mean, generally when you have unstructured data and semi-structured data, which we will be seeing. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, just a minute.
data that is stored generally in unstructured or semi-structured format type sorry not format structure type is generally available here and let's say you want to store it in the form of a database you can do that using the no sql or the non relational databases so the popular ones the popular non relational databases are cassandra you have which is <coughs> using the column format so the data is stored in a columnar format. Then you have Gremlin, which is storing data in the form of graphs, okay, where you have a node and an entity uh, approach. So you have node. <coughs> entity kind of an approach of storing the data, okay. And generally, like if you talk about Netflix, which is the OTT platform. So this is the way it in which it stores the movies or the series or the documentaries it has. So Cassandra is the form of storage. Okay, the it's a non-relational database. Of course, it's a storage, right? So there it uses this particular format of storing the data. Then the other is MongoDB. MongoDB is also a very popular one, and I think it uses a document format of storing the data. Okay. Uh, you can also have, yeah, document way of storing the data is what uh, MongoDB is used for. Okay, so this is your relational and non-relational databases. So your structured data is generally stored if you have data in the tabular format it is stored in the database okay but if you have data which is in the file format and this is the file format that is commonly used so here you use a way or uh, you use something called as storage accounts to store the data Okay, and I will show you, I'll show you a demo of how to create a storage account in Azure because this DP900, like I said, covers data services in Azure. So it also talks about the storages that you can have, which is the storage account, the Azure SQL database, Azure Cosmos CB, okay, for storing data. And of course, you also have the analytical services. <laughs> That are there. Okay. Now moving to the next format of the data. Sorry, the type of the data is called as the semi structured data. So, semi structured data is something that has flexible schema. There is a structure, there is a structure to that schema, but it is flexible. Okay. It is something that is. Um, You can like you can have it in a flexible manner. So the common uh, format in which or the most popular format in which you can store the semi-structured data is the JSON format, which is called as the Java Crypt Object Notation. Okay, it is called as the Java Crypt Object Notation. So here it is like a key value pair that you have key value pair. So it looks something like this. So let's say you go to a library, okay? And in the library, uh, you want to borrow a book or you want to loan a book, okay? So let's say you know the name of the author and you want to find out a book about a specific author, okay? So here you will go to the librarian and the librarian, what it will do? It will enter the name of the author. So the author becomes like a key, <laughs> the way in which you can search the 
a, a specific value. Okay, you can search a specific value. So here your author will become the key. So let's say you have, a, a, so this is, sorry, it's not stored in this format. So let's say you have an author whose name is Agatha Christie. So you can just say, Then you will have the book name. So let's say okay. So this is how, and of course there will be more, many more such book names. Okay, Agatha Christie has a lot of book names. It could also have the publishing date or something like that. I'll just say date as of now. And you can specify or the year the book was published. So we can just say year. The year there has to be a comma. And you can just say 1938. I'm not sure when it was published, guys. So this is how a JSON format is written. Another popular format which was used, which is, I mean, JSON is like an, uh, I mean, how JSON was derived is the extended markup language. Okay, you had the extended markup language, which is the XML format. So this is also a semi-structured format of the data that you can store. Okay. <laughs> then coming to the unstructured data. So here, like how in our structured and semi-structured data, there is some structure to that data, right? There is some structure to that data. So the other, so here, as the name says, unstructured, meaning no structure, there's no schema at all. Okay. Uh, generally, your blobs, that is, Binary large objects like blob. Okay, the uh, short form is called as a blob. So generally, uh, the images, audio, video files that we have, then even your text files or uh, <clears throat> text files or binary files if you have like ORC, Avro, okay. Generally, data that is stored in file format, okay, is available in this particular unstructured data, okay. So generally, if you like, so your semi-structured data and unstructured data, okay, is generally stored in either a file format or a database. So the database we just discussed over here, it is nothing but the non-relational, okay, so here there is no relation between the, uh, I mean, there's no relationship that is there between the this thing and if you still want to store the data so either you go for the file format so here you have your files okay audio video files so if you want to store semi-structured and unstructured data you can do that through two formats again you can go for the file format and the non-relational database that is there so it's also called as no sql database okay
then you have documents you have graphs okay so let me just show you some examples of this So we discussed what is data. We discussed the types of data. So this is a structured data. Then we have the semi-structured data. We talked about the unstructured data. Then two ways in which data can be stored. Uh, so Harsha, please just switch to the presenter view. I think that will help. Just switch to the presenter view. On top, I think you should see a presenter view. <clears throat> so what is a file? So files we have been seeing. So delimited text is a structured data. JSON is the unstructured. So all these, all of this is basically stored in the file format. So this is what is the file. So you have delimited text, <clears throat> which is a structured data. So structured data is have to store it in the form of a file. This is how you can do it. You have the JSON. You have XML. You have audio, videos. Then these are the optimized formats, that is Parquet, Avro, ORC. Okay, optimize row, column, and R. So, Parquet is a most popularly used file format. So, in case you want to optimize your results, okay, whenever you do um, analyze the data and you want to write the data in a form of a file, okay, you want to store the transformed data, clean data. So, ETL, ELT processes, which we will discuss, is a part of the data. If you want to store them, Okay, using the Parquet format is the most popular one, like all your Twitter, like all the tweets and everything that you store. Okay, it is stored in that format. Then the database, we all know what is a database. So you have relational databases, you have no relational databases. So here, if you see, this is the column family. So that is the Cassandra storage. And this is how the graph is stored. This is how document is stored. And this is the key value pair that we just discussed. So JSON files or the JSON, if I have to store, it is all stored in the non-relational database. So this is a relational database. So we discussed the relationships, primary key, and the services. So this is the non-relational database where there is no relationship absolutely with the data. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we have discussed so far. These are the formats of the data and the types of the data. Now let's talk about what is OLTP, OLAP, okay? So let's discuss that. At times, there are certain, there is certain data, okay, that we need to, so there are certain data that is transactional in nature, and there is certain data that we need only for analysis purposes. Now, when we talk about databases, okay, when we talk about databases, generally the data that is there, it is used for online transactional or the workload inside the data is generally a transactional workload, okay? And because it is a transactional workload, the processing that we do on top of it is called as an online transactional processing or the term or the shorter form is called as OLTP. 
So generally, when you have databases, so on top of the databases, when you are supposed to do some basic uh, Yeah, if you want to do like, let's say, acid properties, if you want to apply acid properties. So, guys, do you know what is acid properties? Acid stands for atomicity. Consistency. Isolation. And durability. OK, so could you all let me know? Very quickly, what is, what uh, do you all know what is acid, what is, because generally when we talk about databases, okay, this is what is applied. These are the properties that a database should be, should have, okay, when we are processing. So the processing is transactional. The workload that is there or the type of the data that is there should apply or should be capable enough to have acid properties on top of it. So can you like, let me know what is acid, what is your understanding of acid? Yes, guys, do you all know what is acid? So let's say we have a database and in a database when we are writing queries, okay? So database is very much traditional. So it is only restrained or it has a limit I don't mean by that acid, okay? I don't mean by the liquid acid. I mean by the properties, that is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability that you apply on top of the data. I like the joke, but like uh, I'm not talking about that acid, okay? I'm talking about, yes, absolutely right. Thank you, Nisha. So acid is the answer, uh, is absolutely right. So it's something that maintains the data integrity, the data consistency, okay, that is there. So whenever you write queries on top of a database, okay, let's take a banking example. So when we are working in a, I mean, you have data stored in a bank, okay, you have your money with the bank, right, with a specific bank that you have, yeah. Okay, so let's say I am I'm doing some transactions in the bank on top of my bank, bank account that I have. So let's say I want to transfer money to someone. Okay, I want to do a transaction of money. Okay, let's say Nisha, I, I owe Nisha some 5,000 rupees and I have to transfer those 5,000 rupees to her. So we use net banking. Right. To, I will use net banking or you use GPay or some mode of transferring the money. OK, so uh, when we do that or when we write queries on top of the data, it shouldn't be that when we write a query. OK, or whenever we write a query, the, the process, OK, the process when we of writing the query, it, the query should either be a success or it should be a failure. Right. When we do a coin toss, there are only two possible outcomes, right? There are only two possible outcomes. It, either it is a head or a tail, or when we roll a dice, there are six possible outcomes that could come, correct? So when we do tran banking transactions or when we write queries on top of a database, the query can either be a success or a failure. There is nothing in between, right? There is nothing in between or whenever there is a match played, a cricket match or a football match, either one team wins and the other team loses. 
right? There is nothing in between. Like in like when we talk about about the series format, right? There, yes, I agree. We have a win draw loss kind of a format that I'm not talking about. But when the team is meeting, so either you lose or you win. There is nothing in between. Correct. So that is what is basically atomicity. So whenever you write a query on top of the data base, the query can should the query will either be a success or a failure. Then the next is consistency. So like I said, I have to you know uh, transfer money to Nisha. Okay, I owe money to Nisha. Let's say some five thousand, and currently in my account I have only ten thousand rupees. Okay, and Nisha has let's say five thousand in her account. So before I transfer money to Nisha, I have how much? What is our total balance? That means mine and Nisha's. It is fifteen thousand, right? Before I transfer the money to Nisha, uh, the total amount in our bank balance is fifteen thousand. Now I have to give Nisha five thousand from my account. So after, let's say I have done the transaction. Okay, let's say I have transferred the money. So now in my balance I have five thousand, and Nisha will have what? Ten thousand. So now what will be the total after I have trans transferred the money? It will again be fifteen thousand. So that is what is consistency. So whenever you write a query, okay, and you are performing some aggregation functions. Okay, you're updating the data. Let's say you are performing DML. That is, uh, so SQL has certain languages divided, right? We know in SQL or structured query language, we have the data definition language. We have the data. Manipulation language. Third, we have the DQL, that is the data query language, where you write simple query languages, select languages, sorry, select statements. Then fourth, you have the DCL, data control language, and fifth is transact. control language where you manage the permissions that is grant rollback allow okay those permissions that you have to give on top of the database correct so when we do certain operations like updation operations that is the dml where you perform the uh, updates or manipulations okay deletes updates etc where you are making changes to the data in your database Okay, let's say you have performed those updations. Okay, it shouldn't be that those updates have not been captured properly. Like we talked about the, let's say I had to transfer five thousand to Nisha. I the transaction was proper. Like I transferred five thousand to her, but it shouldn't be that her account then should reflect eleven thousand. Whereas she should have received ten thousand. That means my transaction is not a consistent one. Okay. Then isolation, as the name says, isolation. Uh, <clears throat> you have to isolate your uh, data. Okay. Uh, or is not isolate the data. So you have to isolate your trans transactions that you are doing. So do do not perform multiple steps at the same time. Okay. Whenever you write, also queries, wait for one query to be executed, see the result, then move to the next query to analyze the data. So keep your steps. Like even when we talked about the banking transaction, okay, let the uh let like when you are doing the transfer, it shouldn't be that after you have reached the final step, it should tell you you don't have enough balance to transfer the money. It should be done before, and. It has to go one step at a time. That means your process, the steps that you have in your processes, has to be isolated with each other. They have to be isolated with each other. And then the last property is the durability. So durability means how to handle errors, 
because like when we uh, are talking about databases we are talking about data warehouses or not data warehouses actually databases or, or in general when we talk about creating applications right these applications are going to be consumed by a layman a person who does not know technical terms so let's say during that applic or when that person is uh, using let's say an atm machine okay or is doing net banking okay let's say that person encounters an error okay there is an error that the person encounters it shouldn't be that you display the system message so the end user who is a non technical person who is a layman will not understand what that system is telling you so the way of efficiently handling those errors is what is basically durability so you have to always think about the end user who is going to use your application like the atm you you go to the atm i'm sorry you go to the atm and the atm should display a correct message that the machine is down the machine has ran out of cash etc all of that should be displayed uh, properly right <laughs> i'm sorry let i'm slowly sorry Okay, so it should be able to display that message in a user-friendly way, and that is what is durability. Okay, so when we say when we talk about OLTP, okay, OLTP is something that uses these properties, okay, which is called as as asset properties because of its name, that is atomicity. So whenever we talk about data being stored, so this is how the data is stored in, uh, I mean, the processing that it does is the online transactional processing. Okay, this is how it is done. So OLTP is something that talks about the real-time execution. Okay, like your banking transactions or something that you do is like, something that involves OLTP or ATM machines. Okay, they involve the retail systems, like daily transactions if you have to do. Okay, uh, it is done through the OLTP. The next workload that is there, which is generally seen in data warehouses. Okay. So another difference between OLTP and OLAP, I will just explain to you all, okay? So in a data warehouse, we generally follow something called as an online analytical processing, that is OLAP, okay? So what is a data warehouse? First, let's just talk about that. So we know what is a database, we know what is a storage account. So storage account is like, how you have file system in your local machines or in your desktop, the way you store files. So it's the same thing. So in Azure, you have various ways in which you can store data. So Azure storage services. So one, you have your storage accounts where you store data in file formats okay and generally here you have it in there are two types even over here one is sorry use this one is called as the azure blob storage so as the name says blob which is binary large object which we just discussed okay uh, where you can store data in blob data see also the JSON files, the CSV files, the text files also you can store, okay? And the second 
that you can use is the Azure Data Data Lake Gen 2 storage account that you can create. Okay. So this also hosts files, but this there is a difference between the two. Okay. So this uses something called as flat namespace. And this uses something called as hierarchical namespace. Okay. Then the second, I will show you all the difference. I'll just explain everything and then we will do the practical part. Okay. Uh, that is there. <laughs> then the next storage that you can use. So let's say for relational data. Okay. Relational data you have the Azure SQL database that you can use, which is equivalent as your SQL server. Okay, Microsoft uh, on-premise SQL server that you can use. So it is just a cloud version of the SQL server. So here you can have data, relational data. You also have, for relational data, you also have Azure uh, MySQL. You also have Azure MariaDB. And you also have Azure Post Gray that you can use for relational data. So this is also again for relational data. Then coming to the non-relational data. So either if you have data which is non-relational, unstructured, semi-structured, you go for either of these two storages. Okay, so data in file formats, you go with these storages. But let's say you have non-relational data, then you use a service called as Azure Cosmos DB or non-relational data. Okay, you use it for non-relational data. <clears throat> so in this, you have the you have all the types of non-relational data. So this is like a NoSQL database that is there. So all the column format that is Cassandra, the graph. That is Gremlin. Then MongoDB, that is document. Okay. All of these is available in the Azure Cosmos DB. So the initial things, I'll, I'll also demonstrate it to you all. Very simple demonstrations of them. Okay. Yeah. For relational data, you have another service. Sorry. So I'll just quickly change the number. Before we go into this Cosmos DB, I just want to talk about the Azure Synapse Analytic, Azure Synapse Analytics. Uh, so this was the former name of this service was Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Okay, this was your former name. Now Microsoft has changed this name to Azure SQL Analytics. OK, wherein you also can store relational data. But it will be the workload that you will be looking at is OLAP. OK, so that is why I spoke of this over here. So you have your OLAP work, uh, workload. OK, and this is generally used. This is a most popular, I mean, data warehouse is something that is popularly used nowadays, okay, because lots of people want to do analysis on top of the data. So, guys, just two minutes, I'll just uh, come back in two minutes.
सॉरी गई तो yeah so this is uh these are the services that are there in the azure ecosystem related to the storages okay so if you want to work with uh or you want to store the data on azure these are the services that you will use and i will show you demos on blob storage sql database and azure cosmos db very shortly so before we go for a break i will cover these things just to just before that let me just explain olap okay and this is the way in which uh, data is stored okay olap is the way the data is processed in a data warehouse so now let's understand the difference between oltp and olap okay so i'll go back over here i don't need this so let's say i have the employee table so i'll again take that employee table here so let's say we have this table okay stored in the database so let's look at database or and i told you on top of a database we generally perform the oltp processing or the asset properties are also there so now when we now let's say i want to find out what is the total salary of my employees okay let's say i want to find out what is the total salary of my employees and let's say this table is stored in the database okay stored on top of a database so oltp okay we write the language we use sql so we say select uh, some salary from uh, employee and we get the total uh, salary of the employees okay so over here when we write this particular query okay on top of the database so how does oltp approach i mean what is the processing that is done is what it will do it will go to the first row okay of the table of the database that is there and it will read all the, all the values okay it will read all the values in this particular row okay or the record it will read all the values all the attributes attributes meaning it will read the employee id it will read the name if there is multiple columns between the e name that is hire date um or joining date or manager name etc and let's say the 10th column is the salary column or the last column is the salary column okay so over here it will read all those attributes for the first row okay for the first row it is going to read all the attributes now what it will do within that record or that row it will go and search for the salary column okay and it realizes that the 10th column is the salary column and then it will go fetch the first salary for the first employee now once that is done since databases we all know it goes in a sequential manner it will come to the next row again it will read all the values it will read all the values go to the 10th column that is your salary column fetch the salary and add it to the previous record to the previous value so this is how oltp approaches or processes the queries that you write on top of a database <coughs> that means data is x uh, data is <laughs> accessed record by record that means it will go to the first row fetch the entire i mean it will read all the date i mean it will read the entire row okay and then it realizes okay the 10th column 
is the salary column. It will pick that up and keep it with it. Go to the next row, go to the 10th column, take the salary, add it to the previous salary, and then like that, it will go with the next records in your database. So over here, what happens? The performance, don't you think it will take time to execute it? Right, it will take time. So the performance is low. The performance is low over here. Okay. So this is what is, or this is how OLTP works. And this is generally used in a database. Now coming to the online or the OLAP, online analytical um, processing. So instead, now here also, like I told you in a data warehouse also, data is nothing but relational data only. Okay, here also you have data stored in the form of tables. Data is related. Those tables are related. Here also you can write queries. Even in a data warehouse, you can write SQL queries. Okay, and you can write complex SQL queries. You can do analysis on top of the data, etc. Okay, all of that is possible. But what is the difference then between OLTP and yes, OLTP is used for database only, and OLAP is used for a data warehouse. Okay, this is what is being done. So whenever you, I mean, on top of both, if you have the relational data, you can write SQL queries, you can do all of that. But when we write a query on top, now imagine this table being stored in a data warehouse. Okay. Instead of reading the data record by record, instead of read, reads the data, so I'll just change this. Okay. Instead of, you know, reading the data record by record, what will OLAP do is it will directly go to that salary column and read that entire salary column. So here in OLTP, what was happening? It was going record by record. So instead of OLAP, what it will do, you write the query. Okay. You want to find out the total salary. You write that. And in, now what it will do first, it will do a column in our search. Okay, it will search for that specific column and directly come to that column and apply your query. So here it will have a column in our approach of reading the data instead of a record by record or row by row approach. So here what will happen? Your performance is low. Why? Because it will take time, right? To read, first of all, it will read the entire row. Then it realizes, okay, the 10th column that is there, it is the salary column. It will go to that 10th column, fetch the data. Then it will go to the next call row. Sorry, it will go to the next row. Read all the attributes in that row. Go to the 10th column, fetch the salary data. Correct? Here, instead, OLAP says, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go directly to the column, apply the aggregation function directly on top of the column and fetch the data. Okay, so here what will happen? Performance is high. Instead of reading the data that you don't, and you don't need the employee ID, you don't need the employee name, you don't need the department number, you just need the total salary. Right, you just need that. So instead of going row by row, it will read the data column wise. Okay, it will read the data column wise. And this is what is the difference between a database and a data warehouse as well. So a database uses the OLTP approach of reading the data. That is why the performance in a database is a little low. And that is why nowadays data warehouse has become much more popular in comparison to the database. And of course, you can also write complex queries on top of a data warehouse. You have historical data that gets stored in a data warehouse. Whereas if you drop a table or if you like, um, like if you replace a certain value with another value with, a with the latest or the current data, okay, uh, that will 
not be i mean that will not be available like if you want to see the original value you will not be able to see that in a database so this is what is oltp and olap this is what is the difference between them okay and these are the two workloads that are available or the processing ways in which you can process your databases and data minutes in respect to data okay so this is something that summarizes uh module 1 and module 2 okay so let's go ahead and look at the demos i want to show you all how to create a simple blob storage how to create a sql database and i want to show you all how to you create a cosmos db in azure environment so i have already logged into my azure portal okay uh, and let's go ahead and create a storage service it's a very easy way of creating a storage service so i'll just say come to storage you can search for it over here you can also yeah that is definitely there so when we will talk about etl elt which is nothing but data pipelines that you have in the data architecture so whenever you architect your data okay you need to kind of or you need to have a structure to the architecture because when we talk about an data architecture it's not just one service that you will be using you will have multiple services right and we all know data nowadays there is no one source of data right there is no one source of data we have multiple sources of data from where data can be generated like let's talk about the marketing data also like marketing data can come from let's say social media platforms it can come from uh, certain feedbacks customer feedbacks that you are capturing okay uh, so the source is not the same source can be a lot of sources so you need to extract the data okay and uh, so olap and oltp is just a it's something that internally is done by the database or the data warehouse the extraction cleaning is done something by you is i would say like you will write the steps to perform oltp or olap like the queries that you write and the way it has to be processed it is done by i mean it is done by the system and not you but what kind of cleaning and extraction transformations you want to do you you write it that is what basically it is so it has so even when you do transformations you are writing queries and the querying how it will process it is done through olap or oltp okay it is that it is what i mean by that okay so in a data enterprise so in a data architecture okay there are two processes that we follow that is extract transform and load okay the short form is called as etl so when you have data coming from multiple sources so the first step is to get the data right you have to extract the data okay uh, and the source is not a single source nowadays okay data like i said is the oil it is very critical nowadays you need to use data in order to uh, analyze or you want to if you want to make your enterprise a profitable enterprise or you want to analyze the sales you want to analyze your uh, like even when you are working on a home automation or you are in the manufacturing sector okay you want to improve your uh like if you want to improve your uh outcome okay you need to uh, have data okay and data when we collect data okay data is not generally um something that is in a perfect format okay data is raw we don't know how it will be captured it's not something that you the way you are like like on social media when we say okay somebody is written a comment they are writing it in the way they want it you can't go and tell that particular person that no this is my format you have to stick to that format 
right when they people write comments on social media platforms or twitter or something like that okay or um, upload images the size of the image we can't say it will be of this format or something you will need to change that format according to your requirement you need to clean the data and when we capture the data at times data might not be captured there can be missing values okay the type of the data that you are capturing can be of a different format but you require it in different format okay so these all things you need to clean you need to transform okay so after you have got the data from various sources the next step that you perform is cleaning and transformation and then once you have cleaned the data you put it at a destination so that you can perform reporting you can create reports you can create dashboards if you are a data analyst okay the roles also i will talk about uh, shortly the different roles that are there okay and of course um, if you want if you are a data scientist you also need the data to be clean because if your data is not cleaned okay and like i said basically data is used for analysis whether it is predictive analysis or uh, descriptive analysis or diagnostic analysis okay for any purpose you are using the data for and it is ultimately going to be used for analysis so if you have data the way you have extracted from the source and you are using and then on top of it you are creating reports dashboards okay what will happen is that you are going to get incorrect output your reports will correct will have incorrect data okay your um yes different purposes absolutely right nisha you are absolutely correct on that okay that oltp and olap is the same data only but the purposes for which they are used and the approach so if you want a good performance okay go for data warehouse the like data warehouse and the size also compared to the traditional databases uh, because data warehouse has two tables which is called as a fact table and dimension tables and dimension table so the way they can be structured or modeled actually i would say model okay there are two types of models that you have you have star schema and snowflake schema okay you can model them in these two manners and because of that okay large volume of data can be managed by the data warehouse in comparison to the database and another advantage of a olap is the historical data in the data warehouse okay so historical data in a data warehouse is managed by something called as scds that is slowly changing so there is lots actually to talk in terms of data but we are going to run out of time on it okay and let's say um uh, yeah so I'll, i'll also tell you where you can read about these things okay uh, after like uh, i'll finish the explanation of etl elt we will take a break and after the break i will uh, show the demos first okay very quickly we will do a demo and then we will go ahead and uh, i will talk about the future certifications that you can do okay uh, in um, and also i will talk about some of the analytical services in azure okay what kind of services that you can use in uh, azure for anal analytical purposes okay so this is what is etl and like i said if you have raw data okay and you are using ultimately data is being used for analysis so if you have raw data and that data has discrepancies it has lots of missing values it has lots of errors the uh, data is not captured correctly all of those things are there so naturally your end result is also going to be uh, misleading right let's say your sales data you have you have earned this much but it is showing you a lower i mean your sales data is a little i mean yeah there will be a difference right so it's always a good practice to clean your data okay so either you 
once you extract the data from the source, either you transform it first, you clean it first, okay, and then you load it and through the loading, I mean loading meaning you load it at a destination, okay, again the destinations could be anything, it could be one of these storages where you load the data, deposit the cleaned and the transformed or the enriched data that is there. So this is one way of architecting your data, okay, how the data should flow basically. So if you have to decide on that, so one way is you either use ETL and the second way is either you use extract, load and transform, which is called as ELT. So ELT is the most popular way of architecting your uh, data, uh, the way it should flow. So generally, this is a good practice and lots of enterprises stick to this. They extract data from multiple sources and they get it at a destination. OK, and that destination could be any one of these uh, services that I have listed down. And then at the destination, you make the transformations, you create the reports, etc. All those things happen at a single destination. So this is how you can architect your data. OK, either you extract. So you have uh, multiple sources where you extract the data. OK, so you have these are your sources. Either you transform or you transform these sources OK, at the source itself. Or you can just capture these data. So we'll just capture it. And you can load it at a destination. So this is your destination and, and then on top of the destination. You can perform. Transformation. OK, you can perform. Transformation. So this is how you and in order to extract the data, I mean the sources, the services to transform. So there are lots of tools that you can use for transformation, which I will list later when we do the analytical services on Azure. So that's when I will um, talk about it. OK, so these are the ways in which you can architect your data. So now let's do one thing. Let's take a break. OK, it's almost lunchtime. So let's take a 20 minute break. And post the 20 minute break, we will I will show you all the demos and I will talk about the Azure analytical services. And once that is done, uh, we will complete the overview of the modules that we have. OK, and of course, discuss the roles in data. OK, uh, discuss. So I'll start with the roles in data and then I will do the demos and then we will discuss some of the Azure analytical services. So let's take a 20 minute break. Let's take a 20 minute break. So I'll just start the clock for 20 minutes and I will see you all after that. So it's almost 129. So I'll just keep a 21 minute clock and then we will resume the training after that.
Hello, everyone. I hope you all are back. Please, go. if you all are back, <clears throat> am I audible? Hello? Let me know if I'm audible. Hello? Okay. So let's continue. Let's try and complete the training as fast as possible. I mean, the webinar so that you all can uh, be free early. And so can I. <clears throat> so before we go into the demo, OK, before I start the demos, just one more thing that we had to discuss is the data roles or roles in data. So here there are the roles or the work. OK, since data is huge now and the size of the data is going to exponentially keep on increasing. OK, it is it is going it is something that is going to keep on increasing as so uh, as we have seen that generative AI OK or Gen AI has also revolutionized the gen uh, the AI domain. So that is nothing but going to lead to more data generation. It is going to lead to more data being uh, I mean lots of data that is going to come and that growth is always going to be exponential. OK, and we will require people who are skilled, who have that understanding of data and who know how to manage the data. So there are certain roles that are described in the data domain. They are termed as data professionals. So the very first role that you can have is of a database administrator. That is DBA. So as the name says, database administrator, that means you will be managing most of, that means you will be managing the database and its administration, correct? Who to give access, who not to give access, manage the database, the data inside the database, all of that, okay, maintain the database, okay, is what is taken care by the DBA, that is your database administrator. The next role that you have is of a data engineer. <laughs> so what is a data engineer? So a data engineer. So we talked about the extraction, transform, and load. Correct. So all these processes, okay, all or this this is also termed as data pipelines. Okay, these two things are also termed as data pipelines or the flow of your data how from the extraction till the analysis like we talk about end-to-end -end analytics okay how should your application look like analytical solution uh, should look like that end-to-end -end analytics if i have to do so we put it into a pipeline and that pipeline is either a etl pipeline or an elt pipeline okay so if i have to uh, uh, perform the ATL or the ELT. That means basically clean the data, perform the extraction of the data, okay, transform the data and load it at a destination so that it can be used further for reporting or predictive analysis or train a model or a deploy a model, okay. Then that job is done by the data engineer. So data engineer is responsible for ETL, ELT, data cleaning, I'll actually say responsible for data cleaning and transformation. Okay, it is the job of the data engineer to make your data perfect so that it can be used by a data scientist or a data analyst. So a data scientist is the one who is responsible okay, to develop or I would say deploy or train a machine learning model, train 
responsible to train and deploy ML models. So let's say you are working in a bank and you want to do, you want to predict whether a person should get a loan or not. Okay, and you want the machine to do it instead of a person sitting and doing it. Okay, you want the machine to do it. So you will have a data scientist there. So data engineer will clean the data and share it with you. Okay, and you will give, then once that is done, the data scientist will take that file or whatever, and they will <clears throat> train the model based on the data and predict the outcome, whether the uh, uh, person coming to the bank should get a loan or not. So all those predictions, predictive analytics that you have to do is taken care by the data scientist. And then the last role is of a data analyst. So a data analyst, as the name says, is somebody who is responsible to create reports and dashboards for data analysis. You want to do a sales analysis. You want to do a descriptive diagnostic analysis of your data. Why did your sales go down for, from the month of August to September? Okay. What was your marketing strategy? Okay. Did the marketing strategy boost your sales? What was your EBITDA? Okay. What was your profit, net profit, gross profit, whatever you want to find out, do analysis, get a description and then do a diagnosis of that data. That is, so you do it through visuals. Okay. We all know visualization is something that we all want to, I mean, it's something that we use generally when we say reports, dashboards, because when we visualize the data, right, we we uh, remember things, right? How, why do we see, like when we see movies, it, it is nothing but visuals, right? And we remember them, we remember the dialogues and everything because it was presented to us visually. So, we, and I, I'm, I'm very sure like everyone has seen Drishyam and in that there is a dialogue, right? That we remember things with what we see generally. So if you haven't seen them, if you if you visualize the data, it's something that you remember. Okay, so if I have to do that, we use a visualization technique. And in order to create those visualizations or visuals for us, we need a data analyst. Okay, so these are the roles that are there in data. So now if the data administrator wants to perform data administration, he can or she can use these storage accounts or can use the database, can use the Cosmos DB in order to do that on Azure. So I'm going to talk in terms of Azure only. Okay, here I'm just going to specify the Azure services that are there. Okay, so they will be talking about, so here you can use Azure storage accounts. Actually, SQL database, okay, Postgre, MySQL, all of that will come into picture over here. So if you want to perform data engineering tasks, then you have lots of services on Azure. So you have the Azure database service. You have Azure Synapse Analytics. Okay, you have now a recently new service has been launched by Microsoft, which is called as Microsoft Fabric, which can also be used for data engineering purposes, okay, in order to perform cleaning transformation. So a very popular tool, which is used in no, uh, Databricks, is called as the Notebooks, that you can use even in Synapse Analytics. You make, of, make use of either the SQL Editor, or the notebooks to perform ATL or ELT. Okay, both if you want to do, you can use the notebooks and the same feature has been incorporated even in Microsoft Fabric. So let's say you want to study about Synapse Analytics. Okay, you want to read more about or you want to work with Synapse Analytics, perform data engineering. Okay, so Microsoft has a certification
Microsoft has a certification called as DP203. I'll write it here because the so for Azure Synapse Analytics, they have a certification called as DP203, which is related to how to use the Azure Synapse Analytics. Okay, the environment, the workspace. Uh, is what basically is covered in DP203. Then if you want to work with Microsoft Fabric, okay, it is called as the Fabrics, Fabric Analytics Engineer Associate Certification, which is, or I'll just uh, put it as Microsoft Fabric as of now. So the certification is called as DP600, which you can also look at, which talks about end-to-end -end analytics, okay, using Microsoft Fabric. Earlier, what was the scenario? It was that Microsoft or any other cloud services also, if you see, they have different services to do different tasks. So here also, if, when I list down, you will see that there are different services to do let's say data engineering, data science, or data analysis also, okay? But now Microsoft has come up with a unified platform and that unified platform is Microsoft Fabric, okay? So that is what is becoming very, very popular now because people don't like to integrate things, okay? One service with another, okay? Even though they are on the same cloud platform, it is a challenge, okay? so. Because of that, Microsoft saw this challenge and they said, okay, we don't want people to spend time in integration. We don't want them to, uh, you know, manage lots of services within the data architecture. Okay, because if you have to perform ETL, ELT, and then do data science or data analysis, it requires different services. So Microsoft came up with that unified concept and that platform is called as Microsoft Fabric. Then. If you want to do machine learning, if you want to perform machine learning, there is a service in Azure that you can use, which is called as Azure ML, Azure ML, okay, which is uh, something that you can use. So it's like a low code, no code, or, I mean, not low code, no code, but this particular service is divided into three more uh, tools, I would say, or uh, services within it. One is the designer tool. Then you have auto ML, and you have something called as Python SDK, which is nothing but, again, notebooks only that are used to train a model, deploy a model, okay? Uh, so that is also available uh, over here. So let's say you want to do, you want to learn about Azure ML, okay? You want to work with Azure ML, you want to study about it. So Microsoft has a certification even for that. And the certification name is DP100, okay? It is called as Azure Data Scientist Associate certification which you can uh, achieve i mean you can pursue if you want to train a model deploy a model using the azure services uh, okay and this is for data scientist and then finally you can also perform analysis so if i have to perform analysis we have multiple services to do that we have power bi we have microsoft fabric also and you can also use Synapse, Azure Synapse, for performing analysis. So analysis is not just creating reports. You can also have SQL analysis. Like people prefer writing SQL queries on top of data warehouse or databases. So if you want to perform SQL analysis, you can also use SQL, I mean, Azure Synapse analytics for it. 
So if you want to do Power BI, you want to learn about how to use Power BI. So there is a certification called as PL 300, okay, which targets at Power BI. Okay, how to use Power BI, how to create reports, dashboards, how to share the reports with your colleagues, uh, make it online, okay, for people to view it and perform analysis on top of the reports. So these are some, so these are associate level certifications. Okay, we also term it as, in, in Microsoft terminology, it is also called as advanced role-based certifications. It's called as ARB. So because DP203, DP600 is basically for data engineering, uh, DP100 is for data science, DP600, PL300 is basically for data analysis or for if you want to be a data analyst. Okay, so these that is why it is called as ARB or advanced role-based certifications. So these are the roles in uh, Microsoft, I mean, in uh, data that is available. And I discussed the equivalent services, or, I mean, the equivalent um, certifications also that are available in Microsoft. Also, if you want to go for, like, let's say about, you want to study about Azure SQL database. So let me just check one second. I am confused between two certifications. Let me just clarify that. Yeah. So if you want to work with or you want to be a DBA, that is as your, I mean, that is a, a database administrator. So there is a certification even focusing on Azure SQL uh, database, which is uh, the certification number is DP300, which talks about Azure database administrator associate. So all the SQL, like SQL Server, Azure SQL Server, okay, all those things, if you want to study in depth, you can look for this particular certification. We can't give you free vouchers uh, for these certifications, but since we are Microsoft Core Partners, so we have vouchers which are at a discounted rate. So let's say, uh, 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 I mean, a certification amounts to X, Y, Z amount. Okay, like your fundamental certifications, if I have to see. Okay, if we talk about DP900. So DP900 itself is cost is around this much, okay? So since we are Microsoft Gold Partners, you kind of get around 20 to 30% off, okay? I'm not sure of the exact this thing. So you can just uh, drop in a mail to Archie and Archie will uh, definitely address your, the queries regarding the exam vouchers, but I'm pretty sure you'll get it at a discounted rate from us. So if you want to do these certifications also, okay? Basic ARB also, if you have, if you want, we have some ARB vouchers also available to us. So in case you want to do that, you can uh, definitely get in touch with us and we will provide you with a discounted rate. We don't provide it. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Archie, if you are there, uh, please drop in your the details about the exam voucher. Okay, I, I'll I'll let Archie know about it. Okay, so Manish sir has done it. So he's also a part of Archie's team. I mean, he's the marketing uh, head. So he's dropped in the email, guys. So you can refer to that um, email. So we don't give free vouchers. You can connect to uh, the uh, to that email ID, and you'll get. Uh, you can address your queries about the vouchers as well. So yeah. 
so in case you want to work with is your cosmos db okay you want to get yourself certified or skilled on cosmos db you can uh, look for a certification that is dp420 okay uh, 420 will focus on the uh, azure cosmos db how to use it how to work with it in depth okay so cosmos db like i said is a multi so basically cosmos db is like a multi model uh, it has a multi model um, it's like a multi model database okay uh, where you are um, where you can have all these no sql databases within one account so that is why it is it is a multi model it's called as multi model um, database so there's no prerequisite for these certifications guys there is no prerequisite as such it's something that you should be aware about it okay um uh, if you have any query i mean if you have knowledge about it it's great but it's not compulsory to know okay because you will be learning about it from scratch but if i talk about certifications like dp203 dp100 dp600 also and for that matter pl300 also okay you should have some knowledge about um that particular i mean about cloud in general i would say about cloud okay that means you should do az900 dp900 if possible as far as i mean requirement prerequisite is okay if you are not certified on it but you should have knowledge about it if you don't have knowledge about it then you will not be able to uh, go ahead with it okay so this is one important thing <clears throat> Yeah. So these are the certifications that you can look after DP 900 in case you want to go for a role based, you want to be proficient in one of the roles in data, you can go with one of these services. So now let's go ahead and look at the demos. Okay. Let's look at how to work with storage account, how to create a Azure SQL database <laughs> and how to work with Azure Cosmos DB. Okay, so now I am going to my portal and let's see how to create a simple blob storage and how to upload a data into the blob storage that is there. Also, one more thing, guys, uh, Archie has shared a feedback form. So we would love to hear from you all. How did you find this particular webinar? Was it informative? Was it uh, informative for you all? Okay, uh, did, how did you all find it? How was the session? Did you all, I mean, could, I mean, we want you all to start with the data journey and could we, uh, you know, in, I mean, could we help you with it? So let us know. We would love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. It would be great if you can give us your feedback. It will just take like two, three minutes to fill the feedback. So till the time I'm explaining, showing the demos, just a request to everyone that could you please go ahead and give us your feedback and in coming uh, coming to the recording so guys this particular recording will be available to you on our youtube channel so uh, if you want to access this recording so you will have to subscribe to our youtube channel uh, i think archie has already shared the details in the beginning so she will do it again <laughs> uh, she will uh, provide the record the youtube channel link to you again before we end the session so please subscribe to that channel and we can we will get the recording of this particular webinar okay so now let's go ahead and um uh, let's go ahead and create a simple blob storage okay so blob storage is a part 
of the storage accounts in Azure. So Azure, I mean, Azure storage account that is there. has three, um, it has three, uh, sorry, it has four types to it. Okay, there are four types of storage accounts that you can create. The first one is called as a blog. Okay, it is termed as container in Azure. The second is called as Azure file share. So it's called as file share. And third is called as query. And fourth is called as table. So you can use, so you create one account and you could use one of these four ways of storing your data. So this is like we discussed for blob, for file format, basically, if you have data which is in the files, okay, which is like an audio file, video file, okay, uh, you can use this particular container. File share is generally used to share files between VMs, okay? So if you have VMs created and you want to share files over there, it is used for that. And then table query, you don't need to know. Uh, it's, a, okay, so query is, I'll just give you in brief what it is. So query is like how we have mails, right? We can draft a mail and we can keep it and later we can send it across to somebody. So let's say you have data that you want and later on you want to share that data with a person so you can query it and you can keep it okay so it's like your emails that you write and you query you keep it in draft so that is what is basically query and the table storage is basically like if you want a key value pair of storage similar to your json format but not like json i would say here this is a little still rigid this is a rigid way of storing the data still, but if you want to uh, store the data in Azure, like on top of your files also, if you want a key value pair, okay, you can do that using the Azure table storage account. So here we are just going to see how to create a blob storage, a simple blobs container I'm going to create. So I'll come to my Azure portal. Either you search for that service, or you can come to the resources tab. Okay, under the resources, you will find the service that you require. Or you can just click on create a resource. So any, all these services that I have listed, they are also called as resources in Azure. Okay, so you can definitely use that. So here I have already created lots of storage accounts, if you see. Okay, so here I'll create one simple one over here. Just say create. You need to select the subscription. Along with that, you need to give a resource group. So I'm going to select a resource group. Okay, so DP600 or sorry, DP900 assumes that you all know the basics or the fundamentals of cloud. Okay, that is what is a resource group, what is a subscription. Um, it's, that's it. I mean, you should know that much in order to work with DP900 or with data services on Azure. Coming to the storage account, give give it a name. Okay, you can give some name that you want. So I'll just say webinar storage and I'll say today's date. And I will go with LRS. So this also, if you want to study more, you will have to like, uh, it will be covered in, um, I mean, when we do like a one day training of DP900, that's when these terms get covered. Okay, what is redundancy and etc. at storage level will be covered over there. So since we are we don't have time, it's just a webinar. I'm going to skip this particular um, feature, and of course, I will share the study material with y'all so that y'all can go and study about the uh, certificate. I mean, about DP nine hundred, and there, of course, it is all mentioned in detail. Now I'll just say review plus create. So initially, it will do a validation of the uh, date uh, of your service, whether you have the money to create or not, etc. And once that is done, it will give it will ask you to create. So now go ahead and create the service. So 
So we'll just wait for a couple of minutes. So the service has been created. So now let's go to the resource. So this is how your storage account has been created. This is how it looks like. And if you scroll here on the left hand side, if you see here on the left hand side, you can see you have storage account. So here you have four types of storages that I discussed. Sorry, it's queues. I was, I had a doubt about that. Okay, so this is where you can create any one of the four storage accounts, four types, any one of it. So here I'm going to go with the containers, which is the blob storage. And I'm going to create a simple container called as data. I'll just say create. And to this container, I am going to upload the data. So it could be any data you can upload. So I'll just say upload. Browse for files. I'll go with a simple image file. So I have this image. So I'll just say open. I'll say upload. And now when we create or, or when we upload a data to a storage account, there are four ways of accessing the data. Okay, There are four ways in which you can act not four, yeah, four ways in which you can access a blob file or a container. Okay. So they are called as access tiers. Okay. So the first tier is called as the hot tier. Okay. Hot meaning, let's say you have data which is highly critical. Okay. It is something that you, um, require on a frequent basis okay which is like healthcare or on a daily basis you require this particular data so in order to access that data in azure okay azure has come up with four types of access tiers so if you have data that you frequently access on a regular basis okay frequently access then you should go with a hot access tier Okay, because you might you need to access it every day on a daily basis. So uh, that is why they have categorized certain data which you need to access at a, at certain points. So if you have data that you frequently access, then go with the hot tier. Okay, but let's say there is certain data like sales data that you have which you might access on a monthly basis. Okay, so why store it in a hot access tier? Okay, because here everything in Azure. It's all pay as you go. That means you will be paying for everything. So cost is involved. So you have to be very careful when you talk about, I mean, when you manage the cost, right? Because you have a subscription, you have money, etc. involved. So you, you have to be very careful. So in case you don't have data that you access on a daily basis, okay, you can go with another access tier called as a cold access tier. So let's say you access this data within 30 days okay let's say you have certain data like the sales data which you want to access on a monthly basis or marketing information that you want to access you will love to access it on a monthly basis right so why it's not something that you will do it every day right it will be once in 30 days and then next month you will go and open so now august got over so you want to see the august sales data so Instead of keeping it in hot tier, you can put it into cold tier. Okay. Let's say you want to access date, not cold actually, it's called cool. I'm sorry. It's called cool. Then the next access tier is called as cold, okay, which is where you access data within 90 days. Within 90 days, so after three months, if you want to access the data, you can do that um, using the cold access tier. Okay. 
And then the last access tier is called as the archive access tier. So here, let's say you want to access data after six months or 180 days. Okay, within 180 days or six months, okay, if you want to access that data, then it is recommended that you store the data in this access tier. So you access the data within 180 days. Okay, so this is what is the four types of access tiers you have. So if you see here, when I loaded the data, the default, okay, this is the default way or default access tier that is there. You can definitely change this access tier. So how do we do it? So you just have to click on the image. And you have to come to change tier. So here, if you click on the drop down, you will see the four types of tier that I just talked about. Okay, we, here, if you see, I just talked about the four. So here, you can just change it. So I'll make it to cool. Okay, so that I don't spend much time. So by default, it is always hot. You have to make the changes. Okay, and your now if I click on edit, you will be able to see your data. You can also load another data like a CSV file or a text file. So how can we do that? Let's just see. So you just come to the same container. I will be uploading and I'll just say upload. Browse and I'll just take a simple CSV file and I'll just say upload. And you can see that the CSV file has been uploaded. Okay, you can just change the access to your, you can see the file. So this is, if you click on the edit, you can see the file. So this is the file. You can also change the access to your. You can make it to cold also. Let's say after three, within three months, you will be seeing. So what will happen here is that hot access to your will have the highest. I mean, you will be paying a lot for that. Uh, you'll be paying more, okay, for uh, for the service. I mean, for storing data in the hot access to your. Okay, whereas it will uh, decrease as you go with cool, cold, and archive. Archive will have the, I mean, it will be the cheapest, but it will be like, but let's say you want to access the data in the archive tier. So there is a process that you perform, which is called as rehydration. Okay, it is mean, it means that if you want to change your access tier from archive to any of the, any of the three access tiers. Okay, that process is called as rehydration. Okay, so that is what is there. Okay, so this is what you can do with a date, I mean, with an Azure Blob account. Now let's see how to create a Azure Data Lake. Okay, Azure Data Lake account. Let me just show you that. Or actually, do we have the time? Uh, no, actually, we will move on to the Azure SQL database. Okay, let's do one thing. I'll just show it to you all. It's very easy. We'll do it. And you will also understand the difference between... Uh, so here, in my blob storage, what I'm going to do is I am going to upload a file. I'll say browse. And I am going to upload I'll go with okay, I'll go with this. I'll upload all three three files. okay, these are order details of my company, okay, and I've categorized these orders in three years, that is 2019, 2020, and 2021. And before I upload, I am going to give, so I'll change the access to your first and make it to cool. And I'll write a name for the folder, which is orders. And I'm going to upload it. So here, what it will do. So here it is going to upload the data to a folder called as orders. Okay, so here we have uploaded the data to orders. 
now let's go ahead and create a storage account but we are going to create a data lake gen2 storage account so i'll again go to my storage accounts i'll say create and again i will give the same things but here i'll give a different name so i'll say webinar data lake storage and today's date and i'll go with lrs again now when i now in order to create a data lake gen2 account in azure we need to enable a feature so i told you that the difference between otherwise both are the same it's just that the name spaces the naming convention that is used to name a uh, blob storage and a uh, 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 data lake gen2 is a little difference and i will indicate this difference to you all okay so for that in, we need to enable something called as a hierarchical namespace for data lake gen2 so it's a feature that we need to enable so if you come here and can you see that we need to enable this feature so if i click on this okay this particular service will I mean, this will be a data lake Gen2 account and not a block storage. Okay, so now why we'll see. So the process is the same to create a data lake. And just say create. Okay, so the resource has been created. So now if I go to the resource and if you see here, if you see here, can you see there is a different icon on the containers? Rest all storages remain the same. Just the difference is on the container. So if I go to my storage account and I go to the storage account I have created here. So can you see the icon for the container over here? Isn't it different? Right? They're different, right? So this is the first difference that is there. Now what I'm going to do is over here, as you see, we had created in this container. Again, the same thing. You're going to create containers, etc. Okay, over here, if you see, we had created a folder called as orders. Okay, so the same thing I'm going to do in my data lake Gen2 account. I'm going to come to the data lake account in the containers. Again, I'm going to create a container. I'll give it the same name that is data. They create. And over here, I am going to upload the same file, the same folder. Okay, that is orders. I'm going to give it a name called as orders and I'm going to change the tier to cool. I'll say upload. So now let's say, now let's understand the difference between the flat namespace and the hierarchical namespace. Okay, what do I mean by this? So when we create an account, or we, when we create a storage, blob storage or a data lake gen2, both work the same way. Okay, both are used for file storage. If you have data that is stored here, also you can upload data, which is an image, audio, video, JSON file, CSV file. It doesn't matter. But what is the difference between the two? If I come, so I'll just open these two in separate browsers. So I'll just copy this URL. So this is my data lake Gen2 account. 
and I'll go to my block storage. So this is my block storage containers. And this is my data lake. Okay. So over here we have created the same folder, guys. Correct. We have created the same folder even uh, over here. So I'll just delete these two files. We don't need it. And we have this. So now if I want to delete a folder in the blob storage. So this folder, if you see, okay, this is a pseudo folder. What do I mean by pseudo folder? Now, if I want to delete the entire folder and the contents inside a folder. So if you recall in our local system, if we create a folder and delete the entire folder, all the files inside the folder get deleted, right? That is what is generally, that, that is what happens in our system, in our local machine or in the desktop, right? So here in the blob storage, if I select this folder, can you see that this delete option is disabled? It's not available to me. Why is this happening? Because it is blob storage for folders. It follows a flat namespace. It follows a flat namespace. Now, what do I mean by a flat namespace? So here, if you see, when I create a folder, this folder is a pseudo folder. That means it is not there only. It doesn't exist. It's just for naming purposes that you have given so that you can organize the data. It has no link to the content inside your folders. It's just a pseudo or an artificial kind of a name that you give so that you can give structure to your data within the blob storage, within the blob container that is there. Otherwise, now if you come to the data lake Gen2 account, and if you click here, can you see that the delete feature is enabled for you? The delete feature is enabled. So this is what is, this is how your, uh, this is how normally our local system also deletes files, correct? So this is what is flat namespace and hierarchical namespace. So when you create a folder in the blob storage, it is a pseudo folder. It has no existence. It's just there for name purposes. But whereas here, there is a hierarchy involved. Okay, so whatever contents you have inside this folder all together. So the moment you delete the folder, it will be deleted. Okay, so here, if I click on delete, the entire folder will be deleted. Okay, so you can't see the content, you will not see the folder, but here you can't delete this entire folder. How do you delete the contents? You just have to go to the folder, click on all of these, delete all of them individually, delete. And now if you come to the data, you will then see that the folder has been deleted. So this is the difference between the blob storage and the data lake storage account. Okay, both appear to be the same. Both are used for file format, but this is the difference between the two. So now I will delete this. One second, I'll delete the uh, storage account. And I will delete this as well. Now let's go ahead and see how to create a simple Azure SQL database. Okay, it's very easy. So here I'll just search for it. Azure SQL, SQL databases. 
So let's go ahead and create a simple one. So I'll just say create. Select the uh, same resource group. I'll give it a name. So I'll call it as webinar DB. So this is the name of the database. And we know that the database runs on a server. So we need to create a server. So I'll say create new. Call this as webinar server. Let's see if it's taking the name. Okay. Going with this, I go with ECUS2. And over here, I'll use SQL authentication. I'll give it a name. So I'll just say webinar user. Give it a password. Validate. So all the configurations I am doing. So this is for the server. Okay. And I'll say click on okay. Once this is done, just a few configurations I want to do so that I reduce the size. Just one second. Before this, I want to change it to development. Configure. For. So you don't need to know this. This is just cost cutting that I'm doing because this is not the only uh, this thing I'm going to show. Next, I'm going to go to the networking. And in the networking, by default, this is like a private endpoint. There's a firewall that is added to the database. So I want to make this as a public endpoint. So here you can see if I say yes, yes. Okay, it will allow me to access the database. Otherwise, there's a default firewall that is applied, which doesn't allow any of the IP addresses to access the database. Next, I'm going to go to the security. I don't want anything in security. I'll go to the additional settings. And in the additional settings, I'm going to go with a sample database. So this is an adventure work sample database that I'm going to use. Say OK. And once this is done, say review plus create. So it has done the reviewing process. Just say create. So it will take some time to create the database. So here we have already uploaded some sample data to the database. That means it's an adventure works database. So it will have some tables, I mean tables inside it already. So I've not created any tables, though you can if you're well versed with SQL. So Archie has shared a URL, guys, uh, with you all uh, at around 12.52, which is get your complimentary uh, learning achievement badge. Okay, so if you want, so she has already shared that URL. You have to copy that URL. So I'll just show it to you all. So guys, use the same URL that she has shared in the chat. Do not use any other URL. So I'll just copy this, paste it, and it will take you to a Microsoft portal. So please, if you don't have a Microsoft account, create one. Otherwise, if you have a Microsoft account already, just select that, log into it, select that. Once that is done, you will get a pop-up like this called as redeem, okay? So just redeem this particular code, click on redeem. For me, it's going to give an, uh, so it's done. So you'll see that a badge will be added to your profile. So go to the profile. And in the profile, if you see, you have, you have to come to the achievements tab, okay? You have to come to the profile achievements tab and in courses, you have to come, which is present on the right-hand side. Okay, you have to come to courses. And if you see here, this will be the very first badge that is there. So you have to click on the print icon. You have to click on this print icon. Okay, 
and you have to share this in the chat with us. Okay, so please go ahead and do this process. Till the time this is getting created. So guys, use the URL Archie has shared. Do not use any other URL, otherwise it will not work at all. Okay. So now the resource has been created. It has been successfully deployed. Let's go to the resource and write a simple query on top of this. Before that, we need to come to the query editor, which is on the left hand side. So the code has been mentioned in the link, guys. The code is embedded in the link. You have to use that link only. Do not use any other link. Otherwise, you will not be able to redeem it. So just uh, so you just have to paste that link in a private browser. Please use an incognito or a private browser to uh, redeem this badge. Okay, so now we can go ahead. So guys, please use a private window and or a private browser in order to log, use or redeem this code. Let's go ahead and log into the database. Okay, so this is similar to your SQL edit, SQL server, just that this is on cloud that is on your server. So now I'll say, okay. And over here, if you see, it already has tables. You can just write a simple query. So I'll just say select. Star from DBO dot sales product. I'll just say something like this put a semicolon and run. Okay. Now click on run. Okay, I'll just say sales. Yeah. So here, if you see, it has, uh, it is working the same way as your SQL server. So it's very easy to create one. So you can see you can write any query if you're well versed with SQL, SQL language, you can write that over here. Okay, you can definitely uh, write it. Now, let's go ahead and see how to create a Cosmos DB. So just before that, I will delete the SQL server. Because it is highly, highly cost consuming. So now Let's go ahead and see how to create a Cosmos DB account. How does a Cosmos DB account look like? Let's go ahead and see that. So I'll just search over here as your Cosmos DB. So you can see it has appeared over here. So let's go ahead and create a simple Cosmos DB account. So just say create. And over here, I am going to go for a no SQL. Again, I'm going to take this as the practice group, give it a name. So I'll call this as webinar 
ऑस्मोस डी बी ये बेटा यूनिक नेम हेलो विथ आई डोंट हैव ईस्ट यूएस लेट्स सी ईस्ट यूएस टू and rest i am a given a uh, account name rest all things i am going to keep as it is just say review plus create say create So let's wait till the time this gets created. So Krishna, uh, if you see the link, you have to use this link only. The code is embedded in that link. Uh, please use that only. If you see, I've just pasted the link in the chat. So please use that. in order to in a private browser or a incognito mode in order to redeem the certificate so the cosmos db account has been created now again here also i am going to use a sample database okay we are going to use a sample data only so if i have to create that we need to go to the data explorer and i'll just close all of this and we are going to select we are going to launch we are going to do a quick launch and here you can see that it has taken a sample database okay it will take a sample database and a sample container so i'm going to keep all of this as it is and click on okay so i'm creating a sample database even over here okay so the sample database has been created now i'm going to go to the items and i am going to click on new item so i have a code already just one minute let me copy that
So I'm going to create a new item. I'm going to create a new item in the Cosmos DB. So I'll say new item and I'm going to copy the <clears throat> code that I have. Okay, I'll just quickly write it. I'll just do some modifications. So this is a JSON item that I am writing. Just close the bracket. And now we need to save this. So just click on save over here. And a new item will be added. A new item will be added over here. So once this is done, Let's now query this. I query this database. So if I have to query, we need to come to new SQL query and write a simple SQL query. So it's like no SQL that we are writing. So here I'm going to just add a condition that is where contains C dot name. So this is the key comma helmet. Okay. And now I'm going to execute this query. So here we have the option to execute. So just say execute. And you will get all the information related, all the description in the JSON format if you see for the for this particular condition where the name is helmet, where the product name or the category name is helmet, you can see you'll get all that information over here. So you can just scroll down and you can see the information. So this is how you can create a simple Cosmos DB database for a NoSQL. Very easy to create. It's just a sample one, guys. There's lots you can do over here. Okay. That is possible. So I'll just delete this. So now let's talk about some of the Azure analytical services that you can use. So some I have already listed above. Okay, analytical services. So if you want to do ETL, ELT, you can use Azure Databricks. You can use Azure Synapse Analytics. And you can use another service called as Azure Data Factory. Okay. In order to perform ETL, ELT in your data architecture. So as your data factory, I'll just show it to you all. I have a service already ready with me. Come to the dashboard. So this is how your Azure Data Factory looks like. Where you have pipelines concepts of pipelines and um, orchestration. Okay, if you want to do data movement, data ingestion. Okay, this particular service is used for data movement, data ingestion. Okay, uh, with orchestration. Orchestration is another term for like scaling only, uh, for scalability only, but without knowing 
okay it's something that you do it without knowing like auto scaling only i would say okay if you want to move the data from one source to the destination you can use the data factory so data factory is like a etl tool okay it's specifically for etl etl tool with a low code or no code experience so very so people who still want to do etl elt without much coding okay they can create something called as pipelines so data factory has concepts called as pipelines so this is how a pipeline will look like of course there will be lots of things involved in it so uh, we can like you can just study about that okay then if you want to work with storages i have listed the storages the second thing that you can do for analytics is create a uh, work with data science so we discussed ml uh, as your ml studio you can use you can also create reports dashboards okay you can use power bi or microsoft fabric also now okay so we have already discussed majority of the things for analytical you also have something called as azure hadoop not your azure hd insight sorry not hadoop azure hd insight that you can use which is using the hadoop engine okay so these are some of the services that you can use okay so this is what is so as far as the modules are concerned we have completed the uh, the modules so let me just guide you all on how can you study or where can you study for this particular uh, exam okay so this is the link so i'll just share this link with you all in the chat also where you can come and study about this particular certification that is dp 900 okay so here you can see it all the information is present over here i'll just share that in the chat okay so this is like a 45 minutes exam one hour to 45 minutes i would it say 45 minutes but one hour to 45 minutes is the exam you will get around uh 40 questions 40 yeah roughly around 40 questions and they are all mcq based questions no negative marking anywhere okay so i'll just mention that over here exam duration 45 to 60 minutes uh mcq based it will be completely mcq based prerequisite for dp 203 like i said um you should be aware about azure cloud platform okay like what is a resource group what is a region what is uh, a a subscription okay what is a pass service that's it there is no other prerequisite otherwise everything gets covered in dp203 so that is the only prerequisite otherwise i don't see any prerequisite over here mcq based exam so thing no negative marking there is absolutely no negative marking then uh, followed by that um what else um yeah you need to score test 
700 out of 1000 okay that is 70 percent okay you need to get 70 percent that is 700 so the exam is of 1000 marks uh, but in order to pass you need to get at least 700 and above to clear the certification in order to get the certificate of dp 900 and it will be a proctored exam guys it will be a proctored exam Proctored meaning uh, you will like you will have to share your camera and through that camera there will be a supervisor or a person who will be sitting and he will be constant constantly supervising your exam okay uh we'll look at you constantly see whether you're not cheating or not okay we'll look at whether you're i mean um uh yeah if you have any uh, paper on your desk or anything so please whenever you are attempting these exams ensure you are all by yourself in the room nobody comes and disturbs you it's just a question of one hour okay um so please uh be careful do not let anyone enter your exam room for at least an hour, have a good internet speed. This requires a lot of in bandwidth to give exam. Okay. And um, yeah, I think this much is enough for the exam. So in case you want to schedule your exam, so this is where you can come and schedule. So there are two ways in which you can schedule. One is Pearson View and CertiPort, but CertiPort is not for you all unless you're a student or an instructor like me. Okay. So we can uh, give the exam through this, but for you all this is the site then or let's say so this is the learn modules this these are the four modules and this is where i actually from where i actually described everything okay i just we discussed everything so you can go through these modules study from them okay we uh you can practice there are labs also inside it so you can definitely practice the lab. So the demos that I showed you all, it is from this particular link as well. So if you just go to one of the this things, so here, if you see, we have discussed this. We discussed the storage account. We discussed all of this. If you see, okay. So you can go and study about it. You can also study if you want to, uh, you know, practice before you go for the exam. There is a practice assessment, which is absolutely free. Okay, you don't have to pay for it. Uh, it is absolutely free. It's just to test your knowledge where you lie before you go for the exam. So you can just uh, come and so once you have gone through the learn modules, practice the labs. You can just come and give an assessment. So it's a 50 mark, as, uh, not a 50 mark, sorry, 50 questions are there in the assessment. And I think you should get around 70 or 60% to pass. I'm not sure of the marks. You can just give it a try. Before you go for the exam, and if this is your first time giving a Microsoft certification, I would request all of y'all to take the sandbox experience. Okay, so this is a demo they have incorporated a demo inside this sandbox which will talk about the interface that is used during the exam what is how does the exam portal look like okay what is the interface uh, that is there how can you interact what are the different kinds of questions types of questions so here you can get Though that it is MCQ based, you can get case study based questions. Scenario based. Questions and you can get like fill in the blanks. Yeah, you actually get fill in the blanks. So you have to select from a drop down. OK, there will be like uh, they will give you a statement. Uh, and then they'll just put a dash and they will ask you from the drop down, which is the option. So fill in the blanks and match the following kind of questions. Also organize, but I don't know if it's there for DP 900. I'm not sure I gave this exam quite, uh, I mean, around two, three years ago. So I don't remember exactly. But yeah, this is the general types of questions that are asked in the exam
yeah so you can come here and you can give like your sandbox i mean take the sand uh, experience the demo guys once you all are um, once you have completed studying for dp 900 now if you want to know about the exam so there is an exam study guide so this link also i will share with you all in share it with you all in the chat So this is basically a guide that tells you uh, what is the percentage of marks. I mean, what is the weightage? So if you recall in the first, in the, in the morning, I had showed you all, or in the afternoon, I don't remember, but uh, I had showed you all what is the weightage of each module. Okay, so you can see that over here, what are the different kinds of, I mean, what are the modules mapped with each skill? Okay, you can see that over here. And if there are any changes that are going to happen, all that is logged into this particular exam guide. Okay, all those changes will be mentioned over here. So please, before you go for the exam, uh, please study this. Yeah, one more thing I forgot, one more service that I forgot to mention is regarding real-time analytics. It is regarding real-time analytics. So if you want to perform real-time analysis, that is data is coming from, let's say, IoT data or IoT devices, sorry, not IoT, it's all the data is of uh, real-time changing every minute, every hour, every second. So you can use a service called as the Azure Stream Analytics. Okay, uh, in order to process, in order to query real time data, because real time data changes. So you need a different service, though here it is all batch batch data or batch processing that uh, that is done. Okay, we are there are two types of streaming, right? Batch and uh, real time. So here it is more of a static data that is there in comparison to the real time data. Okay. So yeah. So oh, I'll just do one thing. I will share this with you all. So this is what we have studied today. I'll just share this with you all in the chat so you can access it, okay, using your personal ID. Or uh, I'll also share an image of this with you all. So with this, I end the DP 900 webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. Before you all leave, uh, guys, just a request. Please give us your feedback. Uh, Archie has shared a feedback form with you all. Just a request, if you could give us your feedback. We are here for another 5-10 minutes. So please go ahead and give us your feedback. And if you don't have any questions, we are done for today. Thank you everyone for attending today's session. Have a great evening. And I'll see you all for future webinars. So please do not forget to give us your feedback. That is very valuable. And do not forget. And also all the best for the exam, guys. Uh, please don't call me, ma'am. I You can just stick to my name. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And all the best for DP 900. So in case you have any queries regarding the vouchers, please get in touch with Archie. Um, uh, thank you, Risha. Thank you so much. So she will address all your queries. Thank you, everyone. So do not leave the chat. I am just sharing the um, the discussion that we have with you all that we had today. So I'll just share it with you all in the chat. So once you leave the chat, you will no longer get access to it. So ensure you take it and then you leave it. So I'll also share a image as an image. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, I can't attach a file, guys. So please ensure you take the link.
that I have shared. And also, please, guys, do not forget to give us your feedback. It is very, very valuable.